my father was a professor of mathematics at UBC. He came here, I think, in 59. He was a uh, professor here till about 65. I was born in 62, so I was here for three years. Um, and um, I was born at St. Paul's Hospital, in downtown Vancouver, and my parents still remember the Catholic uh, doctor that delivered me and uh, tells me that story all the time. So it's been quite an experience actually coming back to, to where I was born and uh, the house that we lived in is still here. Ironically, it's on a road called President's Row. My household uh, kitchen was almost like a classroom. My father not only uh, loved mathematics, which is actually his area of specialty, but he loved biology as a high school student and he was a pianist. He would take um, all three of us uh, over dinner and lecture us on a different subject. And so behind his seat at the, at the dining room table, the kitchen table, uh, was a chalkboard. And so he would lecture us about everything from philosophy to anatomy to mathematics to uh, literature. And that was part of our upbringing. But I wouldn't say I was always an academic. I actually wasn't that great of a student. Um, I actually had some problems in school. I didn't do well in trigonometry, which was a great embarrassment to a professor of mathematics. And uh, I had uh, not the most successful undergraduate career at the University of Chicago. So I wouldn't say that I'm a, a typical academic that's always been successful. I had uh, ups and downs in my, in my schooling, to be frank. Quite a contrast to my brothers, who my, my older brother was a valedictorian had straight, straight A's, perfect uh, SAT scores, and got into Harvard College, but also got into to Juilliard. And my younger brother was another one of these geniuses, so I was just, I was an average person. Music is a big part of, of our family, and uh, we, were, we all learned instruments, and I chose the cello because I couldn't play piano as well as my brother, and I went to listen to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and the National Symphony to try to pick a different uh, instrument and I fell in love with the cello. I had a great uh, biology teacher in grade nine. His name was Dr. Phoebus. It was very hard to get into his class. It was uh, almost a university level course. We were using uh, medical school texts in grade nine. But he, he just brought to life um, a field that was exploding at the time. Um, as you know, back then, recombinant DNA was just uh, becoming possible, genetic engineering, and um, th this revolution continues today, as you know. The use of uh, CRISPR-Cas technology to replace uh, disease genes with healthy ones is now reality. And, and so uh, it was a field that was, you know, full of promise when, when I was in middle school and uh, in secondary school. And so I would uh, read everything I could get my hands on. And then in, in high school, I had another teacher called uh, Edwin Gosnell, who uh, went the extra mile to bring me, drive me to listen to Nobel laureates speak about, about their research. And uh, so I had great teachers. And I read a book called The Double Helix, uh, which was about the discovery of the structure, the three-dimensional structure of DNA. And so I, I was bitten with the, uh, uh, with the bug that, you know, in terms of my enthusiasm for biology. And I, I went to the University of Chicago partially because that was where Jim Watson, one of the Nobel Prize winners that determined the three-dimensional structure of DNA, uh, where he went to university. So I, I wanted to go to the same place he went. You know, when, when you're in grade 11 or grade 12, you know, back then uh, we didn't have at our fingertips the information, the, the YouTube videos and all that. So I actually went to University of Chicago sight unseen, got on a, a, uh, a train, an Amtrak train at Pennsylvania Station in Baltimore. And it took many hours to get to Chicago back then. And then I remember um, when we arrived in Chicago, the Sears, it was called the Sears Tower back then, was there and I knew nobody. Fortunately, uh, my uh, parents had uh, friends in, in a suburb of Chicago who picked me up and, and brought me to, to university. But I really had very little clue about the University of Chicago and uh, I eventually realized it was a pretty special place. And um, I was fortunate after that to come back to Canada, to McGill University, and um, you know, excellent institution in a diff different kind of school. Every, every university has a different ambiance and ethos, but I feel privileged to have gone to McGill. 
And then I taught at uh, Johns Hopkins and Harvard and University College London. So all of them are very special places. I was president of the University of Cincinnati uh, in Ohio, and um, I still love it. I still love the people and the city. Um, so it wasn't an easy decision. What happened was I was actually speaking at a marketing, American Marketing Association big conference, I think in Chicago, in front of like thousands of people. And uh, the reason why I was speaking is because I'm a little bit of an unusual president in that I was one of the first to embrace social media. I was on Twitter very early on and uh, I was talking about uh, why it makes sense for a university president to be on social media. And the reason is that you're kind of the chief connector. You interact with government, you interact with alumni, you interact with industry, you, you interact with media. Um, and so the more you can connect the institution uh, through your, your, your conversations and through tweets and Facebook posts and Facebook Live, it's, it's actually become richer with time then you're doing a better job because your job is to represent the institution. So I was giving that talk at, this, at the AMA meeting, annual meeting in Chicago and at the end of it uh, somebody in the audience stood up uh, from Vancouver, from UBC and said, you're the person UBC needs. And I said, I was so happy in Cincinnati and I said, well you know it's interesting, you know I have a, a connection with UBC, my dad taught there. And then from that moment I got a phone call from, from the search consultant who's saying, you know, you've been mentioned as a possible candidate and, uh, you know, would you be open to a conversation? And then those things happen pretty rapidly. And before I knew it, they're saying, we'd like you to be the president of UBC. Um, and so it was a hard decision because um, I was uh, really enjoying my time in Cincinnati. But for me, coming here was uh, very special because I was born here. I was a toddler on campus. I learned to ride a bike on Main Mall, um, so you know, it, it's, it, was, it was quite special. Especially this year and the past year with the pandemic and uh, the move to remote instruction and not being able to spend time with your friends and not having the direct uh, contact with professors and staff, it's been a very difficult time for them. If you think about it, uh, the class of 2020, um, the high, high school class, um, they didn't have a proper graduation um, and they didn't have a proper entry into university and it's not just UBC, almost at any institution around the world, it's not what they signed up for. And so I'm very worried about the mental health of students today, not just the academic pressures, but uh, the changing uh, environment uh, in COVID. Professors are under tremendous stress, you know, when I speak with them, and I speak with them regularly, um, I'm the chair of the Senate at both the Vancouver and, and the Okanagan campuses, so I, I hear from them directly. Um, we're very concerned about their wellness. Um, most of them are putting in about uh, 60 to 100 percent more work for a number of reasons. They've had to transition very uh, quickly from face-to-face -face instruction to remote, so they have to take all that content and transition it for remote delivery. They've had to create videos, they've had to create, uh, um, you know, AR and VR uh, kinds of, um, you know, delivery um, methods that they have to learn. And so they've had to learn new approaches and new technologies and master it um, while they're teaching. And, um, you know, in, in a way, um, they have to deal with uh, asynchronous instruction as well because there are students that are not here in Canada or in BC, they might be halfway around the world. And so you have to take into account the, the time of day wherever the student is. And so you have to sometimes have, um, you know, real time instruction, but also record it for, uh, you know, a student that might be halfway around the world. And you're constantly being asked questions from students everywhere almost 24-7, so it's been quite stressful for, for faculty. Well, there's no playbook. Uh, we, nobody knew what to do, uh, and so we were constantly meeting. My team and I and the deans of the different faculties uh, had to be in regular communication, regular updates to the entire community, communications with government officials, the, the Minister of Advanced Education, the Minister of Health. Um, so a lot, a lot of uh, brainstorming um, and it was very organized. There, were, there was a sector table that was created in British Columbia. We would speak as presidents of the different universities, not only here in BC but across uh, Canada and internationally about what to do. So, so we weren't alone, we were trying to deal with this together. 
it had to happen so quickly because of the rapid onset of the pandemic. And so we, I think over a period of several days, uh, we at UBC pivoted from face-to-face -face instruction to 100% remote. Uh, and we had to start to, to understand a virus that was poorly understood. Um, the public health um, guidelines uh, became more and more uh, strict uh, with time. And so we had to think about all those logistics. Um, there's been a financial impact on the institution. With students not living on campus, uh, that means that they're not living in residence halls, they're not eating. Um, and so there's been a significant impact on the finances of every institution. It's true for every sector of the economy. But, but it happened in universities as well. We talk um, across Canada about building back better. Universities are part of the, hopefully the solution for building back a more resilient Canada. And so we're in the midst of thinking about how do you reskill and upskill uh, individuals who become unemployed so that uh, um, they can be part of a more resilient uh, economy. But it's also true for universities to answer your question. Uh, we now know, uh, as is true for many industries, that much of the work actually can, can be done and in some cases more efficiently remotely. And so uh, we need to, to take advantage of that uh, experiment, if you will, that was forced upon us and, and take aspects of what we learned uh, you know, for uh, the wellness of our faculty, staff and students. You know, in Vancouver, it's very expensive to live near UBC. And so many of our faculty and staff and students live far, far away and they're commuting an hour or two hours to get to campus. Um, and so the question is, is that really the best uh, way uh, for them to work? And, and might there be an opportunity for many of our employees to actually just to stay at home? Because they've demonstrated during this year that they can work even more efficiently. It's, it's not a, a trivial question because uh, some individuals um, have said early on this would be great uh, to, to work from home but they also say now that uh, after several months that they're going crazy uh, that, that being at home working uh, taking care of your kids cooking doing everything without the uh, physical separation to be able to go to work that that actually is important for your wellness so some kind of um, mixture of remote and face-to-face -face is probably the best solution moving forward I think learning is changing constantly, and, and I'm, I'm glad to say that UBC has been at the front end of, of a lot of that change. We had a, a Nobel laureate here called Carl Wyman. He was really uh, at the cutting edge of thinking about how we teach science uh, and moving away from the sage on the stage and hundreds of people in a class looking at somebody with a piece of chalk, um, just passively sitting there taking notes to a situation where that was all done before you get to class and, and really having much more interactive um, learning, team-based learning in the classroom. So it was really innovated at UBC. Um, and, um, but even further innovations are occurring. We have significant investments in the Center for Teaching and Learning Innovation. And a lot of it's going to involve new technologies. For example, our professors are innovating uh, new ways of um, simulating what would happen in a room with cadavers. Um, so um, often there's an issue with having enough cadavers for medical students um, and, and so there's a way that you can actually uh, create that in, in, even in a more powerful way um, by VR. And so you know there's a, a, a professor called Claudia Krebs that has created a, the hollow brain. And so you can put on your uh, AR VR mask and you can imagine hovering around in a classroom a huge brain that you can rotate. But beyond rotating it and looking at the anatomy, you can actually zoom in um, to, to see a whole section and then zoom in to see a couple of cells. You can see cancer cells moving around that brain. You can see uh, immune cells killing the cancer cells. And then you can zoom in even further and look at what's happening in the genes in the cancer cells or in, in, in the immune cells. And so that's a new kind of learning that we couldn't even imagine a few years ago. It's also happening in the School of Music. And, and so, you know, it's very hard. You have, we have conducting students. And, but we also have orchestras. But the orchestras are doing all kinds of classes and they only meet periodically. So the conductors are there, they can't really conduct because you need people to conduct. Well now, um, we've recorded all kinds of symphonic music uh, and they can conduct orchestras through AR and VR. So it feels like they're conducting in Carnegie Hall, but they're actually in their home in Vancouver.
Leadership has to change. You know, if if you looked at leaders in the past and, and some current leaders, it's very top down. It's very hierarchical, and the most audacious, most difficult uh, problems of today won't work if there's a leader from the top trying to solve it. Um, you know, these uh, uh, systemic racism is embedded in every corner of any institution, uh, and so the only way to solve it is to have everyone doing their part. Uh, first, uh, being truthful about the fact that there is racism, but second, actually really looking at themselves inside and asking what parts of, of me uh, are racist and what steps do I have to take to move beyond that. Um, everybody has in, implicit um, bias and an institution can only change if everyone takes ownership of and responsibility for changing the place. So leadership can't work if, if the president says we will fix this. It's got to be the situation where everybody is involved. So you have to be integrated and you have to flatten the organization so that uh, people view you as an accessible partner in, in, in the project or in, in the movement. The other um, key example that we're working on that I hope is a legacy is uh, I hope that UBC is truly impactful in terms of the climate uh, emergency that we face. We declared the emergency um, very publicly uh, in June of, of this, actually December of last year. We, we made some initial comments in June, but um, in a matter of about a year, uh, we've started to divest our endowment. Um, that's significant. But there's so much more that we have to do and so much that we can do as an institution. And to lead that, it can't be me or me and the vice presidents or me and the deans. You have to listen to the voice of the students. You have to listen to the uh, individuals in the communities. You know, climate change has disproportionately affected those that, that are less privileged. And so you can only have a positive impact as a leader if you're there with them and they trust you. And so that's how leadership has to change. You know, right now I'm just focused on, on UBC. I've been a scientist and I'm proud of some of the contributions I've made and some of them have been important for medicines that are on the market. So that's part of my legacy. Um, I'm a father. Um, and so my kids are a big part of my legacy. I'm more proud of my kids than anything else. But I would say that um, at UBC right now, which is my big focus, I'm trying to take an outstanding, amazing institution and make it a little bit better. That's the dream of every university president, is that you inherit the institution from a previous leader, and you hope that when you leave, you can say it got a little bit better. And so I'm trying to address some pretty difficult issues. Um, you know, there's systemic racism everywhere. There's systemic racism at, at UBC. And changing an institution, culture change is the hardest thing that a leader um, would set out to do. And I'm trying to set out to do that. You know, hopefully I'm successful. At least, hopefully I'm successful in setting this, the, the stage and hopefully taking early steps in, in making this really a more diverse and inclusive institution. So hopefully that'll be my, my legacy.